Okay. First order of business. Somebody dropped their phone in the coffee line. <laughs> Anyone missing an iPhone? It's an uh, Android phone. Looks uh, somewhat expensive. Has a picture of Jesus the Good Shepherd on the background. Anyone? No? Okay. I'll leave it with Sandy in the back. And if anyone is missing a cell phone later, uh, it's with Sandy. Or if anybody wants to buy a new phone. <laughs> okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. I'm so excited about this series. And the reason why I'm so excited about this series is because I believe that this series has really the power to really change our perspectives about how we view those who came before us, the desert fathers and the desert mothers, and those who, who sought out holiness in the wilderness. A lot of times when we think of the desert fathers and the desert mothers, we think of their, of their lives as just like antiquated, old-fashioned ways, and in the modern era, it's not really applicable for our lives. But I'm going to challenge you this week, and Abuna Paul is going to challenge you in the upcoming weeks, to maybe change your perspectives and figure out how these Stories that we are going to share and learn from can be applicable to your life today. And today we're going to start with a subject that I think is very relevant. The idea of thoughts. The Desert Fathers speak a lot about thoughts, a lot about temptation, a lot about how when we let certain thoughts enter into our minds, they can hold us captive and they can steal us away from the joy that we have in Christ. And my hope today is that we'll take some of the stories that the fathers share in this book that y'all are reading and that we can learn from them. But the theme verse for our whole series today is this theme verse from Jeremiah 6.16 where it says, Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Another translation says, ask for the ancient paths. Where, you, where the good way is and walk in it, then you will find rest for your souls. Ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it and then you will find rest for your souls. Again, in our context of the world, we think that old means outdated. We think that old means not relative, rel relevant. We think that old means something that I have nothing to learn from. But I would encourage you today to buckle your seatbelts because... The fathers have some cool stories to share with you. It's not coming from me. It's coming from the fathers. So here we go. Let's get started. So let's talk about the climate before the desert fathers and the desert mothers decided to go out into the wilderness. The first thing that we have to understand is Roman culture was a culture that was pretty, pretty messed up. There was a lot of brokenness. There was a lot of darkness. In fact, if any of y'all have traveled to Rome and you saw the Colosseum, people used to sit in thousands and thousands and watch a man be slaughtered by a lion. Man, watch a man be, fight to the death with an, an, an animal. And imagine, like, think about how bizarre this like, culture must have been. That when we see somebody being harmed, we all like, look the other way. When we see blood, when we see anybody being injured, we're like, kind of cowering and running away from it. But these people celebrated death. These people were excited to see a lion chop a guy's arm off and bite his head and bite his leg. It's, it's bizarre. So now think about the culture that the, the, the Colosseum and the Gladiator Games existed in and think about how many of our early church fathers, St. Ignatius, St. Polycarp, many of them were actually offered in these Colosseum Games to be slaughtered by these animals. So the culture of Christianity, pre-monasticism, was one that if I followed Jesus, I was willing to go to death for him. I was willing to give my entire life. It did not matter what they put in front of me. I was not afraid because I believed in a risen Christ and I believed in his power to transform both my life and the life of those around me. So now amidst the culture of holiness, amidst the church, growing and expanding and people giving their lives and ministry and service towards one another. There is this, like, excitement almost for martyrdom. They were, like, looking forward to give their lives for Christ. The church actually was so holy that, the, like, what was considered one of the most heinous sins was being angry at your brother. 
or having conflict with your brother. That was considered what was like the biggest thing in the world. And in fact, that's why the church was able to publicly confess before one another because there was a life of cooperation and holiness that everybody had, a life that people were desiring to be very sincere about their faith. So in comes, amid this decay, there's a group of people bearing witness. And I'm going to just fast forward these large quotes, but this... Basically, what this quote says is their lives were rooted in the most ancient faith possible. Love for God, for self, for neighbor, for the created order expressed in prayer and worship, in sexual purity, in chastity, in shared living, in generous hospitality, in self-denial, in service, in affection, devotion towards one another, caring for the poor, in truthful speech, and directed toward the goal of seeing in some way the kingdom of earth as it was on earth as it is in heaven. So there was this climate in the pre-monastic movement that was a climate of holiness. So, and Tertullian actually remarks and says that the followers of Jesus made manifest their difference in care that they showed not only to the vulnerable members, but any boy and girl who lacked property, parents for slaves grown old and shipwrecks, mariners, for any, for any who may be in mines, lands, or prisons, resulting in their pagan neighbors saying, look, resulting in their pagan neighbors saying, look, there's something among these followers of the way that's different. There's something that they're doing that actually is amazing. So the holiness that was in the church was real. From its meager beginnings of 120 in the upper room to perhaps 10,000 at the end of the first century, Christianity grew to five or six million people by the time Emperor Constantine became emperor. The way was a success, if we categorize it as success in terms of what we think success is. In terms of numbers, it was success. The church was growing, thriving. But why was it a success? Because the emperor became a Christian. The emperor passed the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity legal, and all of a sudden, hey, the emperor is, is, a, is a Christian. I want to become a Christian too. The, 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 the people who are governing are Christians. I want to be a Christian too. So all of a sudden, those who are fighting for holiness, this closed group of people that are really sincere in their faith, all of a sudden starts to open up. With every success, in terms of what we think in numbers, sometimes there's a little bit of a dilution of what's happening. So as Christianity grew in numbers, Finding not only legal protection, but honor and prestige under Constantine, many worried that it had begun to lose its soul. And so the first Christians had once revolted against the illusions of this world. A group of men and women now revolted against the illusions born in Christianity's success. They, re- they retreated into the wilderness, to the deserts of Egypt, Syria, Palestine, and Arabia to recover the way of Jesus that had initially marked the early church. They retreated not in scorn or contempt. What do I mean by not in scorn? They retreated not because they were angry or hated the church. They weren't like speaking bad about the church. They actually had an immense love for the church. They retreated not in scorn or contempt, but because to them, the God revealed in Jesus was so holy, so great, possessed possessed of so much love that nothing less than one's whole being could respond to it. I want to pause on that for a second. These men and women did not leave because they were cowards or they were scared. They left because they said, we want to give our entire life to Christ. We want to consecrate ourselves, be out in the wilderness to pray for the world. And in fact, what ended up happening as a result is men and women from every corner of Christendom went out, began to travel from thousands of miles, hundreds of miles, to spend time and to seek out wisdom from these desert fathers and mothers. They planted seeds in the lives of those who were serving in the city and trusting that the seeds that they were planting were going to go out and inspire the world. So again, I used to have this perspective, confession. I used to have a perspective of monks that they're just scared of the world. So they're going out and retreating because they are worried about their own salvation. But it's far from the truth. The reality is these monastics desperately want to be praying for the world, desperately want to take their lives with Christ so seriously. In fact, there is a monk named St. John Cassian, 
And this monk was so inspired by what was happening in Egypt in particular that he left his monastery in Bethlehem with a friend and went to go study the lives of the, the monks in Egypt. And he spent seven years in the, in the monasteries and in the desert in Egypt, and he encountered St. Moses the Black. And in his encounter with St. Moses, he learned something very beautiful. And I'll share this, uh, this perspective with you. But he basically spent time with St. Moses, and he kept asking him, like, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you so ascetic? Why are you praying? Why are you fasting so much? Why are you so committed? And St. Moses responds this way. He says that the man's on the body are actually only the beginning of the road to progress. They do not induce that perfect love which has within it the promise of life now and in the future. And so we practice the practice, practice of such works to be, necessarily, to be necessary only because without them it is not possible to reach the highest peaks of love. You see the motivation for these fathers and mothers? The motivation is always love. I fast because I want to love more. I pray because I love more. I serve because I want to love more. I do all these different things because I want to be in the image of Christ in every single thing that I do. These practices are not the ends. These practices are the means by which I become like Christ. So St. John Cassian was interviewing these monks in Egypt and finding that their asceticism, their practice, their motivation, their encouragement, their excitement about this movement that was happening was all fueled by what? Love. You, your ascetic without love is demonic. Any movement that happens in the church outside of love is not of God because God is love. So anything rooted in him has to be rooted in love. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again because there are movements that happen in our church and in other churches. Any ascetic movement that is moved without love, without love being the fuel, where I pray more to pray on behalf of my brothers and sisters. I fast for the sake of this generation and the generation to come. I serve because I want people to know the beauty of who God is. Love is always the catalyst. Love is always the motivator. Sorry, I got a little bit worked up. <laughs> so in these desert fathers and desert mothers, there's this concept of thoughts. Now, when you talk to any person in, in the modern climate, people always talk about thoughts. They talk about, Abuna, I have these thoughts. I have these lustful thoughts. I have these thoughts of anger. I have these thoughts of bitterness. I have these thoughts of selfishness. I have these intrusive thoughts that come into my mind every single time I'm coming to pray. How do I fight against these thoughts? The best thing for us to do is always to seek the ancient path. St. Macarius says something really beautiful. He says, the heart governs the whole body, and when God's grace possesses the heart, that it reigns over all thoughts. This is so because the heart is the place where the mind and the thoughts are found. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. St. Ephraim the Syrian also says, Just as it is natural for ocean rocks to be pounded by waves, similar man will undoubtedly come into contact with the assaults born of thoughts. What are these fathers saying? They're basically saying, whether you like it or not, you are going to be assaulted with these ideas of thoughts. Thoughts of things thoughts of distractions, thoughts of whatever hinders you from being on the direction that you need to be on in Christ. So let's talk about how, actually, the devil uses thoughts to mess with us. This is like the, 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 the primary way he does it, and it's fascinating. First, he tries to put you at ease, and he says to you, it's okay, it's okay if you sin. It's okay if you watch this. It's okay if you talk about this person. It's not a big deal. Why? The grace of God is so vast. He loves you so much. He's going to forgive you. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal if you watch a little bit of pornography? What's the big deal if you gossip? What's the big deal if you steal just a little bit on something? What's the big deal if you cut a little bit of a corner of what's called ethical? What's the big deal? You can just look up to God and say, I'm sorry, and he forgives you. But then, once you sin, what does he do? This is phase two. 
where he says, once you go ahead and commit the sin, he says, actually, you're the worst. God will never forgive you. You're terrible. You don't belong. You actually should never step foot into the church ever again. So he makes you doubt the grace of God. He makes you doubt that you even have any place as the beloved and that your identity because of this sin is stolen from you. Can anyone relate to this? Can anyone relate to this? Where you're like about to do something and then you're like, oh, God will forgive me. It's not a big deal. And then you do it and you're, you cower into like, I'm the worst. I should never come forward to for God ever again. And I'm ripping my chest hairs and pulling my hairs out and saying, I'm the worst person. You would get all dramatic sometimes. But the reality is, is this is how he does it. He plants in us the opposite thought. He presents God not as merciful and forgiving, but a merciful ju- merciless judge who will not forgive us. One of the early church mothers, St. Synclectica of Alexandria, she says, when the devil tempts us to be proud, he hides our sins for us, from us. But when he tempts us to lose hope, he places our sins before us and suggests since you have committed all these sins, what, can, what forgiveness will there be? None. To another, he says, since you have been so greedy, how can you obtain salvation? Impossible. The devil's number one goal is to steal you from the kingdom of heaven. He will plant whatever seed in your mind to hinder you from coming to know the truth of who you are in Jesus Christ, that you are the beloved that you are accepted, that he's carved your names in the palm of your hand, its hands, that he's cast out your transgressions as far as the east is from the west, that he's called you his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He wants you to deny all those things that you know about who God is and what he says about you. In fact, there is this story, it's an allegorical story, of called the fourth temptation of Christ. You know the temptation of Christ on the mount? But there is this story that when Christ was on the cross, it's a made-up story, so don't say this is Abuna coming up with some new theology or something. It's an allegorical story that goes that when he was on the cross and he's in so much pain and despair, and there's so much, the, the pain and the whips and the nails and all these different things that are going on around Christ, Jesus looks down from the cross and sees that even his disciples have forsaken him. He sees the soldiers at the foot of the cross gambling and laughing He hears the taunts of the spectators nearby. In that emotion-filled moment, Satan whispers in his ear and says says to Christ, they're not worth it. They're not worth it. These are the people that you died for. They're not worth it. And it's just in that moment that Christ raises up his voice and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus placed an impri- a very expensive price tag on both you and I. A very expensive price tag. That he was willing to do everything for our sake. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might receive the righteousness of God in him. The one thing that we have to be solid in our thoughts is whenever the devil tempts us and wants us to deny the reality of who we are in Christ, we have to Be grounded in who we are in Christ. So here's the stages of thoughts. You ready? First, every thought starts with a suggestion. The mind receives a suggestion or a stimulation, which is the word temptation, some of the fathers say. The devil knocks on the door of your mind and says, sends Jesus to the door. By this, they mean the Jesus prayer. So the devil knocks on your door, temptation, And then in your mind, with that first suggestion, you have to ask yourself, am I going to let this suggestion take me on a direction or am I going to pause in that moment and as the fathers say, quickly respond to that thought? We'll get into that in a second. But the second thing is you start to have dialogue. If you don't shut the door quickly, there's a dialogue that starts to happen. The soul will enter into dialogue with suggestion, temptation, as Eve did with the serpent. Then from the dialogue, there's consent. There is a union or coupling with the thought in which the mind consents to temptation. So it starts with a suggestion, then you start to have a little bit of a conversation. Then you start to consent, and then 
captivity. Here we fall completely under the power of temptation that we are no longer free to resist. It becomes a passion, an obsession, an addiction, and we become captive. One of the things that a lot of people don't recognize is that when Abuna prays the absolution prayer, what does he say? He says, pray that you would be loosened from the bonds of sin, the chains that hold you captive. That there are things that we know that are dark forces that are working against us and that we are asking the Lord to loosen the chains that are upon us. So the stages, suggestion, dialogue, consent, captivity. So what do the fathers say in that suggestion phase? Shut the door. Don't even go down that thought process. A brother said to an elder, I see no warfare in my heart. There's no warfare. I don't have these type of things that happen to me. The old man said to him, you are built a building open on all sides, and whoever wishes can pass through you, and you are unaware of it. If you have a door, you should shut it and not allow wicked thoughts to enter through it. For, when you, for then you will see, the standing, see them standing outside and attacking you. So what is he saying here? Don't be like a door. Don't be like a house with all the doors open. Anytime a thought comes in, immediately shut the door. Now, this is not a desert father. This is my little an analogy, actually, that one of my spiritual fathers said to me. One of my spiritual fathers told me, he said, when thoughts come into you, into your mind, into your perspectives, when you start to believe what you end up doing, these thoughts are like you fighting against the sumo wrestler. When you see this little guy fighting against the sumo wrestler, there is 0% chance that this little guy is going to beat this behemoth, big, heavy dude. There's no chance. He has no chance in the world. But what this spiritual father said to me is he said the only way to be able to defeat a thought is to actually starve it. So this sumo wrestler is your thoughts. The more that you give your thoughts food, the more that the sumo wrestler gets big and fat. The more that you starve your thoughts, the more the sumo wrestler has no fighting against you. So take thoughts as though, and this could be with lustful thoughts, this could be thoughts of anger, this could be thoughts of insecurity, this could be thoughts of a variety of things. If you let the thought in and you keep on festering, the thought gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, you're like this little guy fighting against the sumo wrestler. You can't seem to fight. Starve the sumo. Close the door. Two monks on a pilgrimage came to the ford of a river. They saw a girl dressed in her, all her finery, obviously not knowing what to do since the river was high, and she did not want, not want to spoil her clothes. Without more ado, one of the monks took her on his back, carried her across, and put her on dry ground on the other side. Then the monks continued on their way, but the other monk, after an hour, started complaining, surely it's not right to touch a woman. It is against the commandments to have close contact with women. How could you go against the rules of monks? The monk who had carried the girl walked along silently, but finally marked. I set her down by the river an hour ago. Why are you still carrying her? Tell me that's not baller. <laughs> Tell me. You are sitting here dwelling on the thought. You're sitting here, it's an hour ago. Khalas, like it's done. Like we put the woman down, her clothes are clean, like move on. But you're still dwelling on the thought. You see the principle here? The principle is here is when you let the thought stick, it persists. When you quickly close the door, you squash that. A brother once said to a certain elder, what shall I do when filthy thoughts are killing my soul? The old man replied, when a mother wants to wean her child, she applies bitter herb to her breast. And when the baby comes as usual to suckle and taste, it moves away because of the bitterness it has tasted. You must also use something bitter. What does this mean, Father? Instead of an herb, bring to your mind the remembrance of death and the punishments of the next life. Many ascetics kept it in their, in their cell, a skull, which helped them in their un uninterrupted remembrance of death, when in turn gathers the thoughts and makes the heart contrite. What is this story saying? It's saying when you start to go down a certain thought, maybe a sinful thought, the way you crush that thought is you basically say to yourself, what, what's, the, what's the outcome? What's going to come if I keep going down this thought process? So let's use, for example, the thought of lust. 
So first the thought of lust is you see someone. You see someone and then you start to desire that person. And then maybe that desire goes into watching a movie. And then maybe that movie ends up into you having thoughts. And then you start to maybe think about actually making it practical and acting out on the thought. Then you find yourself committing the actual sin of manifestation of adultery. Then you find yourself realizing that you become addicted to sex. Then you find yourself figuring out that you have lost your whole perspective of who you are in Christ. You see the rabbit hole here? Is that once you open up a door... It can take you down a further door. But the moment that you stop that thought process and you say, Lord Jesus, I want purity of heart. I want purity of mind. I want purity of soul. I want purity of my eyes. Because I want to have purity for not just myself, for my next generation, for the generation after that. I want to stop this, like, this, this, this standard that society has. I want to break the mold. And Lord, I don't want myself to go down this rabbit hole where I could potentially lose my soul because I'm so held up in this specific thought, sin, or struggle. Use something bitter. The fathers put a skull to remember their death. The fathers put something bitter before themselves to remember what hell is. So if that's your motivator, the fear of God is the beginning of understanding. So sometimes a little bit of fear is healthy. A little bit of fear is healthy. If I'm going to go down that rabbit hole of always basically taking for granted the grace of God, then I have to pause for a second and ask myself, am I act- do I really understand like, who God is and what he's done for me? Do I understand that if I continue on this path, it's leading me down a road that's not beneficial for me? Use something bitter. St. Paul says it very clearly. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We're going to do a little experiment here. What did y'all eat yesterday afternoon for lunch? Pay attention. When I ask you that question, where did your eyes go? You're like thinking. You're trying to gather your thoughts from a space, right? Thoughts actually have a space. Thoughts actually have a space. So if you can hold that thought captive and bring it to Christ. Again, this is from my spiritual father who taught me this. And I found it to be incredibly beneficial. Is when you have a thought... If the thought is here, look away from the thought. And what do you do when you look away? You say, nope, not interested. Not interested in going down this thought process. So literally your thought goes here, nope, not interested. Not interested. Why? Why? A brother came to Abba Pumin and said, many distracting thoughts come into my mind and I'm in danger because of them. Then the elder thrust him out into the open air and said, open up the garments about your chest and catch the wind in him in them. But he replied, this I cannot do. So the elder said to him, if you cannot catch the wind, neither can you prevent distracting thoughts from coming into your head. Your job is to say what? Nope. No, not interested. But what do you do when you say no? What do you do when you say no? The point is not to say no. The point is to redirect. So if the thought is here, nope, not interested. And to look within the heart. If it has to start with a beginning of like literally physically looking down, like if if you ever see me looking like this, then you know what's happening. If I'm walking down, (laughs) I'm walking and I'm looking towards my left chest, you know what's happening. What am I do? What are we doing when we look down and look away? You're saying the Jesus prayer. You're saying the prayer of the heart. My Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. You're taking the thought that is holding you captive, and you're pushing it away, and you're bringing your mind back to Christ. And what is this Jesus prayer, guys? Why is the Jesus prayer so powerful? Why do the, the, the desert fathers and mothers talk so much about the Jesus prayer? It's because when you say, my Lord Jesus Christ, you're giving him lordship. You're basically saying, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, 
You are the Lord. You are the master of the universe. You're the one that has the ability to put the stars in the sky, the sun into the, into the, your, the sun to, to rise and the sun to set. You're the one that is able to make the mountains tremble. You're the one that gives grass to the field and lilies. You're the one that brings up, you are the Lord of the universe. So I'm giving you lordship, my Lord Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names, the name that the demons cower from, the name that at every knee bows and every tongue confesses as Lord. My Lord Jesus, Son of God, you're acknowledging his divinity. Have mercy. What is have mercy? I've talked about this probably a bunch of times to you guys. Have mercy, the root word, kirialeson, comes from olive oil. Back in the day when somebody would get a cut, they didn't use Neosporin like we have, antibiotic ointment. What they would do is they take olive oil and rub it on a wound. So when we are saying, Kirialeson, Lord, have mercy, we're saying, Lord, we are wounded. We need you to put your ointment on us. We need you to heal us as a physician. We need you to bind us up. So when you have a thought, a hermit of the desert said to a young man suffering from strong temptation, this is the way to be strong. When temptations start to speak in your mind, do not answer them, but get up, pray, do penance, and say, Son of God, have mercy upon me. The way of the desert is whenever your thoughts start to hold you captive, bring them back to the obedience in Christ. St. Macarius actually says something really cool. He'll say that when you have a thought, speak back to the thought. Counter speak. He says, do not let him deceive you, speaking about the devil. When he does this, do not let be led to despair. After gaining admission through the fall, evil has the power to commune at all times when the soul. And so, to suggest sinful actions to it, you should answer it, I have written, I have God's written assurance. For he says, I desire not the sinner's death, but rather that he should return through repentance and live. What was the purpose of his descent to earth except to save sinners, to bring light to those in darkness and life to the dead? Whenever the devil's taking you down a thought process or you are taking yourself down a thought process, pause and tell yourself the truth. Now, how do we tell ourselves the truth? How do we tell ourselves the truth? Your word is a light onto my feet. Your word is a light onto my feet and a light onto my path. Let's go through some dialogue. Satan says, it's impossible for you to do this. God says, all things are possible. Satan says, you're too tired. God says, I will give you rest. Satan says, nobody really loves you. God says, I always will love you. Satan says, you can't go on. You're at the end of your rope. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Satan says, it doesn't make sense. There's nothing but darkness ahead. God says, I will direct your steps. Satan says, you can't do it. God says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Satan says, it's not worth it. God says, it will be worth it. Satan says, there's no hope for you. Your sins are too many. And God says, I will forgive you. Satan says, you can't manage. And God says, I will supply all your needs. Should we keep going? Satan says, you shouldn't be afraid. You should be afraid. God says, I have not given you a spirit of fear. Satan says, you are too worried and frustrated. You will fail. God says, cast all your cares upon me. Satan says, you don't have enough faith. God says, I've given everyone a measure of faith. Satan says, you're not smart enough. God says, I will give you, give you wisdom. I'll take it back for you now. The moral of the story is, is that if we give thoughts a place, if we give thoughts a place, they will hold us captive. The more that we take these steps where when a thought is suggested, I immediately say, nope, not interested. Bring it back to Christ. Bring it back to the Jesus prayer. The more you'll start to feel that the name of Jesus is on your lips more often, the more that you start to feel strength that comes from with him, the more that the heart starts to warm with his love, the more that you start to feel encouraged by him, the more that you don't let these, these thoughts that are bringing you down a rabbit hole of feeling despair 
But the only way that I can continuously do that and be encouraged is by feeding myself with the Word of God. Now, I will be honest with you guys. I think that we've cheapened the Word of God. I think that when, if I were to, I'm not going to even ask you. I think if you were to ask yourself, how much do I value the Word of God in my life? Do I make the Word of God a priority? Do I make sure that every day before I put my eyes to sleep that I at least read something to encourage me from His Word? Do I seek to know what He says about me? See, the problem is, the reason why we create misconceptions about God is because we let someone else paint our narrative of who He is. But the more that you know God personally from your own encounter with Him, the more that the devil says something or you have these thoughts that hold you captive, the more you can just say, nope, I'm not interested because I know the truth of who I am. It's like, imagine I go to my kid and I say to him, some kids just start to tell him, nope, you're actually not part of like your parents' family. You're like adopted. It's going to be like, what are you talking about? He's like, no, no, you're actually adopted. You're actually adopted. Like, my brother used to say that to me when I was a kid. He'd tell me, like, why do you think you look different than the rest of the family? Like, well, you're, you're adopted. They found you in a garbage truck outside of, like, he would always say, and I'd be like, no, that's not true. That's not true. And my mom would just come up to me. She'd be like, you dummy. Ya rebi. Like, like, you dummy. You look like me. You look like me. Like, you sound like me. You talk like me. Don't you see the resemblance? And the moment that she said that to me, I was like, you know what? Yeah, no, you, you're adopted, Mike. You're adopted. <laughs> no, but the reality is, no matter what somebody says about you, you know the truth of who you are when you know your parents. You know the truth of who you are when you know God. You know the truth of your identity in Him when you have an intimate, real relationship with Him. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. See, again, we think that everything that is going on in our life is the end. Like, if I make all this money, if I, like, build a house that has a four-car garage, if I buy myself a really nice car, if I do this, we think that this is the end. I remember hearing an uh, analogy that Abuna Anthony one time shared, and I loved it. It stuck with me for so long. He said that life is like a game of Monopoly. In the game of Monopoly, someone has like Boardwalk and Park Place. You all know about the game of Monopoly? The person that lands on Boardwalk and Park Place, it's like the highest rent. He builds hotels on it. When you land on that property, he's going to suck you dry. He's like the Besha. He's got everything. Life is like a game of Monopoly. And in the game of Monopoly, no matter who makes the most money in the game of Monopoly and who wins the game, what happens at the end? It all goes back in the box. That's life. Life is no matter what you achieve, no matter how much you accomplish, no matter how much, if the goal is not for me to bring it to Christ and to utilize it to transform this earth as it is in heaven, you ain't bringing it with you. You think you're going to bring your riches with you? You think you're going to bring your four-car garage with you? You think you're going to bring your uh, S550 with you, your Rolls Royce, your Rolex? You think you're going to bring it with you? It ain't going nowhere. Your kids are going to take it, and their kids are going to take it. So you're putting so much value into this as though it's something that actually will give you an identity. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. Your identity is the beloved. Your identity is known in Him. The moment any of us deviate from that. That's the moment we lose our path. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask for them. Because in them, you will find the way of life. I pray that every single one of us in our community groups could be real, honest, vulnerable, share the reality of all the thoughts that are going on in our minds, and we could encourage each other to be the best version of who God wants us to be. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.